Today's video is all about Lunasa or Lamus, a sabbat on the Wheel of the Year. So if you would like to learn all about this sabbat as well as ways that you can celebrate rituals and correspondences and to see my recipe for a very, very special bread that I'm gonna be sharing with you, then do get yourselves a nice drink, settle back, relax and enjoy. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that you're well and safe. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about the greater Sabbath on the wheel of the year, Lamas or Lunasa. This Sabbath is a greater Sabbath or a cross quarter Sabbath in contrast to the solar Sabbaths such as the autumn and spring equinoxes and the summer and winter solstices. In some previous Sabbath videos, I have discussed a little bit more about the wheel of the year and how that came to be. The Wheel of the Year has been popularised in modern pagan religions, New Age communities and of course within Wicca and it was conceived by Aidan Kelly in 1974 and essentially the Wheel of the Year brings together solar festivals along with some ancient Celtic Irish festivals that have also been honoured in different ways across the globe and there are different ways that each sabbat kind of has come to being so it's really important to consider each sabbat separately however it's also important to understand that these celebrations on this wheel of the year that we now celebrate as witches and pagans and wiccans and uh, spiritual people today that was never the way that everyone always would have celebrated some of these sabbats and festivals would not have been honoured and others were depending on the culture and the community, etc. So it's really important just to bear that in mind. I do plan to make a general video about the Wheel of the Year going forward. For today though, we are focusing on Lunasa or Lammas. It's also known as the First Harvest Festival and it's often thought of as being the beginning of autumn. Lunasa is spelt in several different ways. There is the Old Irish spelling and the New Irish spelling. It was also known as First Fruits and the Anglo-Saxon celebration of loaf mass is most likely where the term lamas derives from. Lamas and Lunasa also align on the wheel of the year with the season of Leo and that peak of summertime but also when we're starting to wane into the autumn time. So there is this great abundance and this celebration. The Anglo-Saxons would have celebrated loaf mass on August 1st. Some celebrations also occur on the 2nd. So whilst the classic Celebration is usually on the first for Lammas. In Robert Graves's The White Goddess, it is listed as the second, and some writers have also said the seventh. And I think that the celebrations, again, as I've said before, can be kind of observed over a period of a few weeks or days, however you wish to celebrate. So Lothmas appears in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in 921, and it appears as the Feast of the First Fruits. So this was a time to reap the first harvest of the crops and to turn that into the first loaf, hence the celebration of loaf mass. In Stations of the Sun, Ronald Hutton also references another English text, the Red Book of Derby. In these texts it describes how this first loaf would have been consecrated within the church. In a book of Anglo-Saxon charms it is said that the bread is to be divided into four pieces and crumbled into the corners of a barn before the grain is to be brought in and that is essentially a kind of blessing to protect again the rest of the harvest. So this was whilst a celebration it was also a very tense time when you didn't know how good the harvest was going to be. So this was the very very first harvest it was really important that people honoured it in a very sacred way so that it would honour the land and the deities that they would have worked with and to show reverence and to then protect the rest of the crops and the livestock etc. So again we're seeing similar themes echoed throughout some of the other sabbats that we've looked at. Ronald Hotton also explains that in medieval times Lunasa or Lammas was known as the ghoul of August and that I believe was a point of contention. It was a time simultaneously for celebration and gratitude as well as preparing for the rest of the harvest and for the winter ahead. So there was a tension there but also a great celebration. So it has a similarity in that way to the festival of Yule which of course is a different kind of Sabbath on the wheel of the year because it is a solar festival rather than one of these greater Sabbaths. The other greater Sabbaths are known as fire festivals and this technically is also a fire festival. However there are a lot less 
references to fires or bonfires and when they do occur they don't seem to necessarily have relevance so i think that that's really really interesting as well because there's less of that protective fire element to this seasonal celebration which you wouldn't imagine because i still think that you know having a bonfire is one of the most beautiful ways to celebrate and definitely stay you know that's definitely something as a modern pagan or witch you can do in your practice and i absolutely love utilizing the element of fire within my practice fire magic candle magic all of that stuff so i just think it's really really interesting to note that there's less significance on the element of fire and the need for a bonfire in this sabbat is really really interesting the anglo-saxon celebration of lammas was also a really really important time for the payment of taxes rents lands and also elections for local officials etc that was a really really important seasonal activity at that time so within the irish festival of lunasa a common story that is retold is that of lu and talitu the goddess the sun god lu and talitu was said to be the foster mother or godmother of the sun god and lu held her in such high regard and praised her so that he created this series of epic games like the Olympics which I think is really interesting because of course we always have things like that within society these days like Olympics etc happening within the summer we also have school sports days <laughs> which I think is really really cool because we've recently had ours for our kids and I obviously took part in school sports days when I was younger as well and I just think it's definitely part of our culture today and um, how we celebrate and it's interesting to see how these themes are reflected within our real lives so Talitu was an earth goddess she was known as an earth deity and and some of her associations are with bread and grain and of course that makes complete sense for the season as well because it is the first harvest and baking of bread etc is really really special at this time and really sacred and really important and a great way to celebrate. I will be doing a little bit of baking later. The idea is that these games were to show honour to the land by bringing all of this energy and this competition and this healthy kind of drive to achieve this ambition. There is more about the goddess tell it to you in Patricia Moynihan's book which I have there. goddesses and heroines and there is also some really really nice activities and stories to read and references to the god Lu and to Talitu and the games etc within this book here so there's a lovely festival and then there's songs etc and there's always some really really great things that you can do in this book as well especially with children this is lovely to engage in crafts etc with children so we can go into some of these in a bit so what's interesting is that the common perception is that Lunasa is called such because of the god Lu. And Ronald Hutton goes into this in Stations of the Sun and discusses the various potential origins of the word Lunasa. So this Irish festival is referred to as Lunasa as early as the 15th, 16th centuries in the Tokma Emia. I hope I'm saying that correctly. But within this text as well, it is also referred to as Bron Troigan. And Bron means wrath. So it has these different names. And Thomas F. O'Reilly in Early Irish History and Mythology 1946 makes the argument that there isn't really a very good reason for Lou being in the title of the Sabbath Lunasa, which, you know, I find contentious because I think that there are quite a lot of associations that go together, but I do think it's an interesting thing to consider and definitely you can read more about it in this book. Whilst Lou is known to be the sun god, the god of the harvest, the grain, he's also supposed to be a god of human skill and perhaps that's also why he ends up creating these games that are about showing that skill and improving that skill and creating competition to, you know, motivate everyone to improve their skills. I think that that's really interesting. This argument as well goes on to inspire other arguments about the ways in which the word Lou is used in other Celtic words, such as the names of places in France and in Spain. But essentially, there's that question there as to whether or not this deity really did inspire the names of these places because he was held in such high regard within the cultures. And this discourse goes on to inform Mayor McNeil's arguments in their book, The Festival of Lunasa, which was written in 1962. And this study basically brought together medieval literature as well as like folklore from within the British Isles. What is included in Stations of the Sun is the following, which is a conclusion. A solemn cutting of the first corn, of which an offering would be made to the deity by bringing up to a high place and bearing it. A meal of the new food and of bilberries, which everyone must partake. A sacrifice 
of a sacred bull, a feast of its flesh, with some ceremony involving its hide, and its replacement by a young bull. A ritual dance play, perhaps telling of a struggle for a goddess and a ritual fight. An installation of a head on top of a hill, and a triumphing over it by an actor impersonating Lou. Another play representing the confinement of Lou, of the monster blight of famine, a three-day celebration presided over by the brilliant young god, or his human representative. Finally, a ceremony indicates that the interregnum was over and the chief god in his right place again. So this is about cereal and potato harvests in August and there are 78 examples within this text of these being found, mostly in Ulster and also scattered throughout the rest of Ireland, some on the North Midlands, etc. There were also some records of these rites being performed next to rivers and sacred wells, so that is certainly of significance. As with a lot of these studies, they are a hypothesis, an imagination of what may have happened. So there is still that question there and I think that's what Ronald Hutton speaks so beautifully about and it's so so interesting to go into the depth of this. In Scotland as well there are some references to this time of year and the celebrations that would have occurred and on the 15th of August there was the Catholic festival and feast of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. I'm going to say this wrong but La Fiel Mia is said to have been quite close to the festival of Lunasa as well. There is a beautiful verse here that is listed in the Carmina Galedica, which some of you may be familiar with if you work with Scottish witchcraft in your practice. That's an old text that I don't have, but it's one that I would very much like to get and research and learn more about. So it is said that people would rise early to pick the first of the newly ripened corn and make it into the Molinian mare, the fatling of the Mary Bannock. Each of the family would then take a piece and walk sunrise around the household fire singing Lollet Mare Mathis, the paean of the Mother Mary. The embers of the fire were then put in a pot and the procession was repeated around the house and the farmland singing the paean again. And the singing went as follows. On the feast day of Mary the Fragrant, mother of the shepherd of the flocks, I cut me a handful of the new corn. I dried it gently in the sun. I rubbed it sharply from the husk with mine own palms. I ground it in the quern on Friday. I baked it in a fan of sheepskin. I toasted it to a fire of rowan, and I shared it with my people. I went sunways round my dwelling, in the name of the Mother Mary, who promised to preserve me, who did preserve me, and who will preserve me, in peace, in flocks, in righteousness of heart, in labour, in love, in wisdom, in mercy. For the sake of thy passion, thou Christ of grace, who till the day of my death will never forsake me. And I think there's something so beautiful about that. So whilst it's definite that the fires were not a massive part of this festival, there are references to some fires, especially within the home, the hearth, and bonfires in other areas other than Ireland. In Marion McNeil's The Silver Bow, written in 1959, there are records of some of these rites being performed as well within Scotland. However, there is a question of the locations of these rituals and these customs because it's not specified. So the idea is, is that during this time, the Highlanders would have wanted to protect their homes and their crops and their land and their cattle, and they would have gone around in readiness at this time to put up protections and more of those blessings for the season to come, including rowan crosses over the doors, or a ball of cow's hair put into a milk pail, or tar daubed from the ears and tails of beasts, or blue and red threads tied to tails, or incantations spoken over udders. There you have a lot of really really beautiful folk customs that were likely to have been performed at this time. There are certain ones here that I'm sure that we can put into our practice as well, many of you probably do, such as rowan crosses or rowan berry charms. And whilst many of us aren't farmers, if you are, you can utilise those charms. Maybe you don't want to tie things to the tails of your animals. But they are really, really lovely things to consider and to work into your practice. But I do think things like the rowan charms, the rowan crosses, and incantations into the milk, etc., is a really, really nice thing to sort of take on board and reflect in your practice if there is a reason for you to do so or a way that you can do so safely. I really would not, if and if I had a cow, tie anything to its tail, I don't think. But I really, really do love using protection magic, especially these old folk charms. So this is gold dust, I feel like, for a folk witch such as myself. 
and also reflecting back to the record of the rite where the bread would have been consecrated and then separated out and crumbled within the four corners of a barn. You can do that with your land and your home. Obviously it's a little bit messy but you wouldn't put like a whole loaf in your house but it's just something you could do in like the corners and your windowsills. Just something to protect and obviously eventually you'd want to clean it down and remove it but it's something, it's a little charm that we can bring into our practice and I really really love that. Something that is really, really lovely is that a lot of these old Lammas celebrations are still customary today, such as in Exeter, which is near where I live in Devon, Chumley, Honiton in Devon again, I live near Honiton, South Queensferry near Edinburgh, and there is a revival in the 1940s Young Farmers Club in Southern England for the custom of a presentation of the first sheaf of harvest at church on the initial Sunday in August. So that's lovely that these things are known of, and there's also the Cornucopia. I believe that Silver Raven Wolf refers to Cornucopia as a title of this celebration within Strega. So we're talking about a Sabbath here that has quite a lot of nuance to it. It is one of the older ancient Celtic Irish festivals but it's not a fire festival in the same way. It is a greater Sabbath however it's kind of forgotten. That's something that Jason Mankey discusses in his book that it's sort of sometimes forgotten because people are so busy living their greatest summer life but that's almost like the beauty of it because you can morph it into whatever you want it to be. So if you are with family or friends, you are going to fairs, parties, celebrations, having feasts, eating bread, baking bread, playing with your children, woodland walks, days at the beach, barbecues, camping, all kinds of parties and ways that you can work those into your witchcraft practice. And I think Jason Mankey really discusses this beautifully in his book, how you can turn something that's kind of ordinary and make it magical because you're the magic. Um, and he doesn't say it exactly like that, but that's essentially what I got from it, that this is one of those Sabbaths that really does present nuance, and there is a lot to draw out of it as well that's really, really interesting if you can kind of untangle it. There's a lot of folk practices we've seen, and there's a lot of ways in which you can incorporate those into your celebrations, into your practices. And there are also themes that come through of celebration, of tension, of anxieties, of feeling not good enough, unworthiness, as well as like a need to prove one Self and a need for competition because it keeps us young and healthy and vibrant, right? And keeps us striving for more and pushing for more. I think that's something that we can take on board as well and maybe do some shadow work around if that's something we feel safe to do. Another thing I think is really, really interesting is considering where you are in the world and when the first harvest actually is. Now I've looked into this and in Devon it is around mid-June is the first cereal harvest. And interestingly enough, in The Guardian in 2018, it was said that the first harvest in the UK was actually in Devon. So it's quite likely because we're in the south of England we have a sort of slightly warmer climate sometimes that this would be the place that that would happen. I don't know if that's the same every year, that's just a reference that I found. I think it's very interesting but yeah mid-June is really when our first harvest is. So where we are now it's not exactly the first harvest but we can still celebrate with those traditions, with the baking of the bread, with the blessing of the bread, the consecration and using that bread in a ritual way to bless and protect our homes and set us up for the autumn ahead. I also think the comparison to Yule is really, really interesting as well because whilst Yule isn't exactly Thanksgiving or Mavon or Samhain, there is this theme of gratitude that kind of comes in now, I think, and continues through the rest of the sort of autumnal Sabbath. So next up we have Mavon, the autumn equinox, then we have Samhain, and then this theme continues, I feel, until we get to the winter solstice and there is this peak of gratitude gratitude and celebration and I think it's really really beautiful to be mindful of that as well as this builds this gratitude it's like a balancing act and a need for this harmony between the tension of you know needing to make sure that that harvest is there that we have what we need to continue the work but also a celebration of like how far we've come and how well we're doing you know I think that's really really key so within modern paganism as well as the god Lu and the goddess Talitu there is also the story of John Barleycorn and also the green man as well these are of great pagan significance and very very interesting so I always read this from this book which is from Dylan early Irish literature and it says each smooth nut puts forth its shell at the end of its branch on the margin of the cornland. The yellow grain dons its husk underneath a fresh bending break. 
So the idea being that John Barleycorn or the green man is known as sacrificial god because there's the cutting of the grain and that sacrifice must be made so that we can have that harvest and eat and prosper throughout the darker months. So we've seen references to sheepskin, we've seen references to rowan, we've seen references to bannocks, we've seen references to corn of course and grain, as well as references to meat and bread and nuts and barley and fruits, different fruits. So those are some correspondences that we can work with at this time. Of course a popular craft is to create a corn dolly out of the remaining husk and that's something that I've done a couple of times in my practice which I absolutely love to do and I'd quite like to do that again this year. There is a medieval poem as well listed in this book. This book is The Druid's Herbal for the Sacred Earth Year by Ellen Everett Hopman. I've pretty much referenced this in all of my Sabbath videos. This is a really interesting poem that reads as follows. There comes for neglect of it boldness, weakness, early greyness, kings without keenness or jollity, without hospitality or truth, from rees and rees. And essentially I think this is interesting because we're meeting this sort of waning king, which is very interesting when thinking about the earth. And it says without keenness or jollity, without hospitality or truth. And I think these are really, really important virtues to remember at this time of year as well. A time of competition, chariot races, it also says here violence, enmity between wives and husbands and of course then there's the settling of debts and of payments, taxes that are due etc. So there's again this weird balance between like the tensions and the payments that need to be made, settling of debt. But this time is also said to be a really auspicious time for marriage as well which is interesting. So again you have that dichotomy there, it's really really interesting how that happens in a lot of these sabbats. So there are some herbal correspondences within this book, but of course that's not all of them, but I will read them off for you. There's berries, any kind of mixed berries. I think strawberries are really, really ripe at this time of year. There's also references to bilberries that we've seen. There's fenugreek, frankincense, heather, corn, rowan, wheat, hollyhock, mistletoe, oak, oat, and sunflower. And of course, lots of seeds. So within this book you have a lot of different correspondences as healing uses as well as magical uses, homeopathic uses for these herbs and plants and it's just a lovely, lovely book for that reference and for the poetry as well. Other things that I also associate of course are things like honey and milk, bread of course, berries, fruits, apples as well because we're getting close to the first apple harvest so I do think apples are really, really interesting in this as well. I also think blackberries as well because I am noticing blackberries are growing on some of the brambles near us. I was at the Woodlands yesterday and there were no blackberries, however on our walk to school we walked past quite a lot of brambles and there are an abundance of blackberries already ready and some of them are quite high which is nice because my son can't get them because he tries to nab all of them and I'm like save some for the birds please. It's quite nice because some of them are quite high up though obviously were the first for the sun to get to. So I really think that we're having a ripening of the fruits in an earlier way but I reckon yes by August we are going to be seeing our our first blackberry harvests and our first blackberry and apple crumbles which I absolutely love doing so I can see that coming in now as well. I love this book as well this is The Kitchen Witch by Soraya and within this book there is a lot of different lovely recipes. A lot of them are very very homey very hearty hearty and hearty so there's a minestrone soup which is very very hearty beautiful Italian dish. Spaghetti bolognese of course who doesn't love that. Biryani so this lovely rice dish. Chicken with tarragon I absolutely love tarragon so I think that tarragon is a beautiful herb to work with, to cook with, and to work with in your magical practice. I feel like it's very grassy and earthy, but also really, really delicate and fragrant, and so I think that it can be put to a lot of uses magically. Creamy potato and nutmeg, mustard mash, roasted roots, so you can see some of these root vegetables as well, stuffed peppers, lemon tartlets, strawberry tarts, yogurt dressings, and then you've got lots of loaves. So an I lay low, an enriched dough with sugar and some fruits. Then you've got different lamas breads, ciabatta, wholemeal, granary, garlic bread, and strawberry jam as well. Mm, okay. So I'm gonna share with you now a recipe that I created for this year, and it's a Lunasa Lamas Sun Bread. And I created the recipe myself, but I did use the technique for a different bread that I will share below. So essentially, the technique is that you create a dough and then you separate it out into discs that layer on top of each other with butter, and then you pull it out 
from the centre to create a sun shape. So I used the technique from a different loaf and the technique I will leave below. I will leave the link so you know where I found that technique. But the recipe for the dough itself is my own and it's a recipe I just love for an enriched dough and I've of course worked magic into it as well. So I'll be sharing that with you now. So I do hope you enjoy. I was really, really pleased with the way that this one turned out and it was absolutely delicious. The children just loved it. So I really, really hope you enjoy. So first things first, I have 100 milliliters of warm water here and I am going to add in two teaspoons of the yeast and I'm also gonna add in my sugar and I'm gonna give it a whisk. Get it all started. That's gonna sit to one side for 15 minutes. So I'm just going to imbue my energy into the yeast, I'm going to push out my energy through my hands, I'm going to speak intuitively to the yeast and I'm going to blow life force energy. So I'm going to now sift, I have 600 grams of bread flour here. And I'm going to imbue my intention. So I'm going to be adding a teaspoon of this salt. Just a little bit more for luck. Here I have oat milk and this is 250 mils of oat milk. And I'm gonna to add to it a couple of teaspoons of this honey. Oh like a tablespoon and I'm gonna gently heat this up push my intention in for abundance prosperity love we have one egg this is this is for richness and abundance it's all frothy so that's going to go in there. So I'm going to add the 600 grams of bread flour into the yeast. I'm also going to add the 250 milliliters of milk minus oat milk. I have a tablespoon of olive oil and an egg and I'm going to whisk this as it's quite a wet dough and I'm going to bring it together in the bowl before I take it to the workspace to knead it out. And I need for about 15 minutes to put the timer on. I like to do it by hand. This way I can imbue all of my magical intention into it energetically through my hands, push all of my energy through, speak to it, and lovingly, tenderly nurse it and bring it to life. So I have an oiled bowl here, just the bowl I used before. And I'm placing a couple of tea towels over the top and I'm going to leave it in the sun because it is a really sunny warm day today and it can just absorb the beauty of the sun. So here it is in all its glory. It's been resting for an hour and a half and it is puffed up and beautiful. It's just absolutely stunning. So I love this part. So next we're going to just bring it together into a round ball shape again and tuck it under like you're tucking a baby to bed and essentially you're going to want to cut it in half and I have my greased baking sheet ready with greaseproof paper, it's just a pizza sheet. So I'm cutting the dough in half and the first half you're going to use for the first five layers of the bread and so you want to divide up the dough into five pieces. Now I did this using some scales to make sure that I had an accurate measurement and once I did I rolled all of the pieces of dough up into balls and then I started to roll them out into the circular shape. You want to aim for around 20 centimeters diameter 20 to 22 or so 
essentially I found this really really difficult I found it difficult to keep it in a circular shape and I found it difficult to keep it there because of course the dough is really springy so I got my hubby to help a little bit but he also struggled so when I came back to it I found that just being really persistent and then also using my hands as well as the rolling pin helped somewhat and then just putting it on the breaking sheet and using the melted butter this is about three, four tablespoons of butter. And then continuing with the remaining four pieces, doing the same again and layering them on top of each other. And you put a layer of butter in between each, apart from the top layer, which you leave without the butter. And then what you want to do is use a very, very sharp knife and you want to cut it into eight. Once you have cut your eight pieces, you want to pull out each of the pieces into a sun shape. And this is going to be the outer part of the bread. So with the second half of the dough that you cut away before, you want to just take away a quarter of it. This is going to create your sun face. And for mine, I crafted a little face using a little bit of extra dough and I use just my knife to shape the face. So next you want to use the rest of the dough to create another five equal pieces. Again, use the weighing scales and then shape them into a ball each and again do the same rolling out process. This time you want to aim for about 15 centimeters each and again buttering each layer apart from the top layer and then cutting into eight and then pulling out each from the fold. You want to make sure as well that you cut in a different place to the first cut so that you end up with this layered effect and then you just put your sun in the middle and then essentially you want to leave it again for another half an hour or so to prove a bit more. And then you glaze it with an egg wash, which I really enjoyed this part. And then I sprinkled mine with some poppy seeds as well as some sunflower seeds. I did think that after I had put the poppy seeds on the sun face, you couldn't see the sun face so clearly. So maybe next time I'll just put the seeds on the outer edge. So then you want to bake your beautiful sun lammas loaf for between 35 and 40 minutes, depending on the heat of your oven. Our oven is really hot, but I did find that after about 35 minutes, it was perfect. I did get a bit nervous because inside the oven it looked more done than it was, but it was just perfect. And it was kind of a little bit like a cross between a baguette and a croissant in terms of its texture. It was so delicious and the butter between each layer just gave it this really beautiful layered enriched dough effect. So hence why I felt like it was a lot like a croissant and a bread roll in one. It was so delicious and the children absolutely loved, loved, loved this. We served this with some roasted chicken and some veggies grilled on the barbecue. I really, really hope that you enjoyed seeing how I created this beautiful loaf to celebrate the Sabbath this year. I'm definitely going to be making it again. I thought it was absolutely delicious. So I wanted to share with you, circle back to this book, Circle Round by Starhawk, and just share as well some of the crafts that are listed within this book. So there's the Sacred Knot, which is a ritual with a number of people. Hug Tag, a game that you can play. A musk Oxen in Peril. So again, this is a game. Cougars and Joggers, again, a game. Game. The bee dance with children, which is very, very sweet. The first fruits wreath. So for this you need apples, a glue gun and a paper plate. A corn husk chain. Hopes and fears. This is an exercise to support children to express their hopes and fears, which I think is really, really beautiful. Lammas candle holders that you can create. There's a lovely exercise here with hope cards that you can create with children. Orange candles as well to hollow out a candle, a little bit like Candlemas. I remember doing this at Candlemas. 
spiral cookies. These sound absolutely delicious with this chocolate in these. Butter and eggs and all the good stuff. Spiral almond orange buns. These also sound absolutely incredible with lots of sugar and almonds and melted butter and orange juice. Then there's also the long arm loo shish kebab. So this is lovely for children as well. And you can use meat and orange juice and soy sauce and honey as a marinade. And then you can do dessert shish kebabs as well with fruits. So just lovely, lovely ways that you can celebrate with children in this book. So I would definitely recommend that you get this book if you're interested in doing some crafts with children at this time of year or just your family or just for you, it's just fun. So I also want to get into a few of the lessons from this book, which if you've been following the last few Sabbaths that I have been talking about, I have referenced this book. This is The Noble Art by Tiffany Lasik, and this follows on from The Great Work, which was her first book about basically working with the Wheel of the Year in a very psycho-spiritual way. Again, referencing Lou and the games of Lou and Halidou, and essentially what Tiffany outlines here is that this festival elevates humility, but this can extend to self-denigration and also to provoke subservience. But it does celebrate pride, inviting the sharing of strength and ability in the arena of healthy and uplifting competition. So there is a core issue in cycle six, which is the cycle we are on, and this axis with Imolk. Lunasa has a shadow belief of I'm a failure, and perhaps that is where all the competition comes into place. The opposite of that being in Imolk, the shadow belief being it is not okay to feel my feelings. Feelings are irrational and therefore unreliable. And I feel like this is really interesting on this axis. It's like not trusting in ourselves and therefore not believing that anything we do is good enough, which I think is something that we all suffer with, especially creatives and empaths seem to, in my experience, seem to struggle with this the most. And so I feel like many, many people can benefit from the lessons of shadow work in this book. And I really, really love the way that it takes the themes of the Sabbaths and sort of condenses them in a way that you can work with them shadow wise. So Tiffany characterises the shadow aspect from this Sabbath as being stinking thinking or an all or nothing thought process. And essentially these can be traced back to feelings of shame and feelings of unworthiness. If something's all or nothing or lacks that nuance or it's never or always, but human beings, this is what Tiffany says, human beings do not exist in absolutes. So when the language of absolute shows up, it is a tell that a shame has been triggered. So that's really, really interesting. And that's perhaps where the competition to win and the motivation and need to motivate people comes into view in this time of year. So it's a really, really interesting way to work with the Sabbath and themes. So we can reflect on this in our own lives, on our need for validation, on our fear of failure, our fear of success, and our need to win, and then about releasing what no longer serves us from this, essentially. So this all or nothing thinking, not being able to see ourselves. Here Tiffany says we need to be able to see ourselves and have pride in ourselves from the perspective of doing our best with the tools we have. Acknowledging our strength and our ability provides solid ground. So it's not about winning, but it's about taking part. And they always say that, don't they? But it, it just doesn't come through when you're a child, but that, that phrase really, really is sticking in my head right now about taking part and just being in the games. That's the most important thing. And having fun and, you know, enjoying it because that's what we're here for, not to win, but to have a realistic perspective of ourselves and to be proud of who we are and what we bring to the table because everyone, everyone offers something so different. It says here, if we have addressed the shackles of shame, certainly in releasing a tendency for all or nothing thinking, we are able to practice discernment, bringing a beautiful focus to the vision of our lives. We are able to home in on what is choosing, all that serves us well, and walk past all that no longer aligns with our truth. So it is about discernment. It is about being able to say, no, that's actually not for me, or no, that's not part of my reality, or no, that's not my belief, and thank you, but no, I'm going this direction. And that's something I think that we get with the wisdom of age. But also I think in going through these experiences that these habits bring us can help to enrich our lives and help us to grow in these ways. And so working through the themes of the Sabbath can be really, really nourishing if you want to do that. 
think I have summed up everything that I wanted to discuss here about Lunessa, about Lamas, some of the history, some of the scholarly discourse around the Sabbat, some of the folkloric records, some of the theories around what could have happened, some of the herbal associations, correspondences that are listed in folklore as well as just from what we see in the world, some things that you can do to celebrate in your practice, in your life, to celebrate with those that you love. I've shared my recipe for my sun bread and the technique that I found online that you can also use yourself if you want to shape the bread. You could also just use the recipe for the dough and create it in a loaf if you wish. There's no reason why you have to create it in that shape. I was considering also doing like a wheat sheaf, but I think that that needs to be a sturdier dough that's more a sort of decorative kind of thing. So I actually wanted it to be like really yummy. So I decided to go with the sun. Yeah, I really, really hope that you enjoyed it. Do let me know if you try the recipe, what you think of it. Give me a like and a comment down below if you're excited about this Sabbath. If there's anything else that you have read or learned about this Sabbath that you'd like to share, please do. Obviously, everything I've said is not exhaustible. There's so much that goes into this Sabbath, so many books that talks about this Sabbath. I think it's really, really interesting to go to the historians like Ronald Hutton and then look at some of the older source material, some of the older texts and some of the scholarly texts, some of the academic ideas and some of the history that we can piece these things together in a way that can become really, really enriching for our practice, as well as also looking at more psychospiritual resources like Tiffany Lasik's book and then looking at some pagan witchy books as I have done and looking at ways that we can celebrate some of the stories, the herbal responses etc I think it's just really really lovely so I really really hope that this has provided a broad idea around this habit and helped you to kind of consider what you'd like to do again I'd love to hear so leave it in the comments below do let me know and if you've been watching my channel and you're not yet subscribed please subscribe I would love to see you here again click the little bell notification as well while you're subscribed so that you're notified whenever I create and upload videos like this I have a patreon page which I am really really excited about I am slowly getting a little community over there and it's lovely we now have a discord server as well that's exclusive there are some benefits as well that I share on patreon I'm creating some custom book of shadows pages where I'm sharing some of the recipes that I include on here but I also will be creating further tiers down the line I would like to offer some tarot readings through those tiers some more content that might not be suitable for YouTube and some content as well around working with Morrigan so this is all in the pipeline but at the moment it is one tier and essentially it is to support me to continue to make content here which I love to do I do put a lot of work into these videos so it's also really really helpful to have a little bit of support to help me to continue to do that I have an Instagram page as well and a TikTok Instagram is somewhere I'm very very active I share a lot on there including new and full moon tarot spreads that I create for each lunation those are custom spreads for the time according to where the planets are what they're doing and the aspects etc I'm also now creating full forecasts and I'm sharing part of those forecasts on my Instagram and the rest of the forecast is exclusive to my Patreon and within the exclusive part I go into details about herbal correspondences to work with as well as crystals and ritual ideas that you can engage with during the full or new moon specific to the themes that are going on with relation to the planetary aspects and happenings. So it's really very specific and tailored to the moment but it's also really really great for shadow work etc because a lot of the tarot spread prompts that I create and work Work with those can also be used as journaling prompts as well so you can use them in both ways whilst I share the image of those on Instagram I actually do include a full size image on my patreon as well so if you wanted to go over and support me you get just that little bit of extra perk as well as the book of shadow pages that I'm creating and then as I said there will be more tears to come in the future of course I mentioned Instagram and TikTok. I also have a buy me a coffee page as well as a direct PayPal link if you're interested and there is a super thanks as well down below. So if you want to thank me through YouTube you can do that as well. You can just click and donate whatever you want. That's something that is pretty new but yeah that would be lovely if you wanted to support me that way as well. All of those things are wonderful and really really helpful but of course I am so so grateful that you are here and that you've made it to the end. It means so much to me that you are engaged and that you want to learn about the things that I'm sharing and that you want to learn more about my practice as well because what I share is very educational as well as experiential and I want to be sharing more vulnerable parts of my practice and real parts of my practice as well as sharing the witchcraft basics and some more advanced
advanced topics as well and teaching a little bit more. So I have said that I'm going to be offering readings. I had a little blip because I was unwell. So if you have asked for a reading, please bear with me. I'm getting to it. I would like to set up a portal so that I can create a calendar, a way to structure those readings. But in essence, if you would like a reading, you can contact me. I will never actually DM you though and ask you if you'd like a reading or say anything weird like Grand Rising. If you get that, that is a fake. I've had a few, not that many thankfully because my account isn't really big enough but a couple of people I think these people just have too much time on their hands to be honest with you if you see that honestly thank you for letting me know but the best thing you can do is just report them and I'll be doing the same etc just don't give them any money because it's a scam so with all that said all the rambling aside thank you so much for being here if you did make it to the end of the video I'm so so grateful it means the world to me drop me a comment below leave me an emoji of a loaf of bread whichever loaf of bread you wish and I really really hope that you have an amazing Lunasa Lamas and celebrate this beautiful season that we are in. Enjoy so many blessings and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Mwah. Bye!